Good morning. So you didn't have the delight of sitting here just before the 9.30 service and hearing the giant poop. You were here. Okay, you were in Bible study, yeah. Somebody's transformer somewhere over there popped, and, and only our PowerPoint went out, but I'm, Carol's up there looking at why won't the bells play, and I, I suspect it has something to do with a, a little power surge or something. Anyway, thank God we've got electricity today. <laughs> Because it's nice to see each other as we come together to worship God. If you're our, our guest today, um, everything will be up on the PowerPoint, God willing. So you don't need a lot of paper, but we'd invite you all to find one of those blue cards and uh, drop it into the offering plate, whatever personal information you want to pass along so that we can be in touch with you. Today we get to go another step into our looking at emotions that, that we deal with in our walk with the Lord. And so we'll be talking about fears and anxiety. But to deal with all that, coming into the house of the Lord together and calling on his name is the way that we go. So let's stand right now and turn to him as we gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing God's praise. So we come into the presence of this holy God and quickly realize we're sinners in need of a Savior. And so we turn to the Lord in confession. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy 
and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you, and in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue in song. pray together. O oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. I may be seated as our reader comes forward. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Lent is from Ezekiel chapter 33. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. And you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus have you said, Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And you, son of man, say to your people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him when he transgresses, and as for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall by it when he turns from his wickedness. And the righteous shall not be able to live by his righteousness when he sins. Though I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, yet if he trusts in his righteousness and does injustice, none of his righteous deeds shall be remembered, but in his injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, Yet if he turns from his sin and does what is just and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has taken by robbery, and walks in the statutes of life, not doing injustice, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the sins that he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is just and right, he shall surely live. Yet your people say, the way of the Lord is not just, when it is their own way that is not just. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. And when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is just and right, he shall live by them. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, I will judge each of you according to his ways. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. The epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and 
all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. And let's stand for the reading of the gospel lesson. Before I introduce it, uh, so Ezekiel it's this call to repentance is very personal for him, watchman for Israel. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, so taken by the call to people not to get caught up in, in works of darkness. But Jesus takes it to another whole personal level. And I want you to be ready to listen for this because what's happened is some disasters and, and a tendency sometimes, at least back then, was for people to say, so with that disaster, those people must have really been sinners that God let that happen to them. Listen to what Jesus says as we read from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Glory to you, O Lord. There were some present at that very time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all suffer and likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? The vine dresser answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated, and let's join together in this great old hymn that focuses where we're going today. Be thou my vision. We need Jesus to show us the way.
of Jesus, dear friends. Last couple of lines. Heart of my own heart, whatever be fall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. When fears come our way, we need Jesus to show us the way. King David understood that even before Jesus physically was born onto planet Earth. He talks about the Lord like this. When I'm afraid, Lord Almighty, I put my trust in you. I trust in God. I'm not afraid. I praise him for what he has promised. What can a mere human being do to me? So everybody feels fear and anxiety from time to time, and none of us want to feel that way all the time. I know from experience. Three times during my high school years, I was in cars that went sliding off the road twice. It was an icy road, once a wet road. And, and guess what? Fears still haunt me. Whenever I face slippery road conditions, it's just stuck away in the back of my mind somewhere. So when I made my first trip to Florida back in 1973 to serve down in Fort Lauderdale, you all, well, okay, you didn't do it, but God gave us this wonderful Florida welcome of an afternoon downpour so heavy that where's the road? <laughs> I-95, uh, I hope that I'm still on the highway when the rain finally lets up and I'm not in the median strip somewhere. For about 10 years after we got married, a little different kind of fear, I, I experienced a, a fear overnight on Saturday nights. I'd have nightmares about being late for church. Okay, that, that's a, you can understand that. But the, the crazy part of it, the neurotic part, if you will, was I could not find my robe or I could not get my robe on or my robe was filthy black. <laughs> Different things happen that create anxiety in us or real fears of danger. Change is one of those normal parts of life that, that can produce excruciating fear or anxiety. You move to a different house, different city, and, and you're the kid in high school, am I going to make any friends there? This could be horrible. Or leaving home. Or your child leaving home. <laughs> anxiety strikes your heart as a parent. Or, or just getting pregnant. How is that all going to work? Or getting sick and it's a serious illness. Or having dad or mom become dependent on you, or losing your job, career change, or divorce, or death of somebody close to you. It happens. We all face fear and anxiety. By the way, are you feeling miserable yet? <laughs> so we're going to start today by asking, can we distinguish, can we understand the difference between fear and anxiety? So for me, the feeling of a car sliding out of control, it's a very real fear. There's physical danger present. On one of those times, it was a bad accident that happened, and I realized I could be dead, but for the grace of God and his holy angels. The nightmares about not getting a robe on for church reflect anxiety and apprehension that has nothing to do with physical danger. It's just worries about getting caught unprepared. <laughs> I was thrilled that somebody coming out of church said, yeah, and I used to have anxieties before the next cantata. Well, thank God. It <laughs> doesn't make it healthy. It just it happens to us. So for our purposes today, let's use this simple distinction between fear and anxiety. Fear is the body's normal reaction to danger. And, and God, like we talked about last week with anger as a red flag that God's given to us, the way the body responds when it feels endangered is a gift from God. And I can tell you how that feels because about 18 months ago, Carol and I are, are out west in Glacier National Park hiking the high trail, and it's not a real wide trail. At some points, it's downright narrow, and you're looking down 1,000 feet or looking up 500 feet, and... And somebody tells us about the grizzly bear that met a hiker on that trail two weeks earlier. <laughs> so it wasn't real danger at the moment, but we could imagine how dangerous it could be there. And, and this system that, that God has put into us 
allows us to respond with a faster heart rate, a higher blood pressure, more blood sugar. Do you know what that feels like? I'm ready to go. It's the fight or flight response of the body that, that God designed through this sympathetic nervous system of our, our body. Well, this is not a psychological lesson today. So in a moment, we're going to come back around to how God's Word helps us with the physical danger piece. But first, let's talk about the anxiety piece. Anxiety is the mind's unhealthy reaction to danger, real danger or perceived danger. It's feeling apprehensive without knowing exactly why. So after I finally quit having nightmares about being late for church, I was able to get a little more realistic take on, on what had happened. It probably was about the possibility of embarrassing myself so badly in public that I could never do church again. And so how did I cure that? By embarrassing myself regularly enough to discover that it was not life-threatening or career-ending. <laughs> So anxiety is a normal part of life. Here's the point. Much of our anxiety could be dealt with in a much better way if we could just identify what we're feeling uneasy about and see whether it's something we should really be fearful of or not and then make a decision about what to do. For example, if one of your parents becomes dependent on you, which I think many of you have been in that position. It's just different from having your children dependent on you, isn't it? So when it started to happen in my family, you realize there's some very realistic fears about there's going to be enough time to deal with. How's the money going to work out? Do we have the skills needed? But then there's this whole other level of anxiety that's harder to identify. It's the emotional issues, the the role reversal, I am now the caregiver for someone who cared for me and raised me up, and the guilt that comes along, am I going to be able to take time for my spouse and kids to, to be there for, i got to be there for mom or for dad. And, and again, it's a nice psychology lesson. So here's how God helps us with our fear and our anxiety. And one of the great examples comes straight out of the Christmas story. Joseph, right, gets the word that is soon-to-be wife, Mary, is pregnant. And he knows that he's not the father. And so you can just picture anger, fear, what are people in the town going to say? Grieving. Oh, I thought we had such a good thing. And all those emotions are swirling around, overwhelming him all at once, and God says, I'm sending an angel. Gabriel, get down there. And Gabriel says, do not be afraid. Why not? <laughs> do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, <clears throat> for it is by the Holy Spirit that she's conceived. Oh, no other man involved? No unfaithfulness? Huh. <sighs> and by the way, we don't even need a reveal party. She's going to have a son. <laughs> And you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And Joseph's going, wow, God, you had this plan all along, didn't you? This could really work out for the best. And you can just feel his, his heart rate coming down, his blood pressure relaxing, and blood sugar levels going back to normal. Peace is restored in his soul. And then joy begins to fill his heart. He went and married Mary. And the rest is history. Now, unfortunately, God doesn't always intervene that miraculously, right? When we're feeling some fear and we've got some anxiety going on. So let's take a little closer look at anxiety so we can deal with it more effectively with God's help. First of all, I believe anxiety is caused in unhealthy ways. Much of our anxiety has to do with what I call negative self-talk where we repeat negative thoughts that are going through our mind. This is terrible. This is awful. Carol and I have a relative who was known for that. Now, if, if you're a really creative person, you can take that negativity into a, and make it into a two-step process. I mean, you can get really good at this. First of all, the negative predictions. I just know it's going to turn out badly. How do you know that? I just know it's going to turn out badly. And then you can take it to the next level, 
negative and distorted evaluations if that would ever happen. And when it turns out badly, my life is going to be toast. I'm ruined. The problem with negative self-talk is that often we don't really realize what's going on inside of us. It, it, it happens kind of at a subconscious level. The tapes just keep playing over and over in our head and, and they're raising our anxiety level and sending a message to our brain that says, stress alert, stress alert. And your brain tells the rest of your body, raise the blood pressure, up, elevate the heart rate, get the blood sugar going. And a little bit of stress is a good thing, right? The alarm clock goes off in the morning. Okay, I, I, I needed a little nudge to get moving. But ongoing stress without any physical action is very unhealthy, especially when we're not even aware of the destructive results that might be going on inside of our body because it's not just the damage to our bodies from long periods of elevated heart rate and blood pressure. Your doctor will tell you that's not good. High blood sugar, no, that's not good. But as our minds recall how we felt anxious and panicky in a certain situation, every time we start to think back to that situation, and somebody came up to me and, and said, yeah, that's exactly the way it works. I remember the, and I'll tell you the rest of the story, the very first person, probably two or three years into ministry, and, and, and a lady starts to describe how going into the mall was an anxiety-producing event for her. Every time she'd think about her next visit to the mall, not only would the anxiety from that time long ago, but the recurrence of thinking about it gets the fear cycle going and pretty soon it turns into a full-blown panic attack. Now, if you've never been through one of those, I haven't, but I've listened to people explain it. It's a frightening thing because you feel totally out of control. Where is this coming from? And, and it's very tough to retrain your mind not to send those panic signals. So again, it's not a psychological lesson today. How does God help us? How does God interrupt the cycle of fear and anxiety. Psalm 56.3 When I am afraid, O Lord, I put my trust in you. First step, take your fear, take your anxiety to God. Don't ignore your fear, it's there. Don't hide away your fear, but instead take it to God so with his help you can deal with it. God, I trust you to help me. Ask God's help. Well, what happens when you ask God's help? Immediately you're refocusing on God, not on the fear, right? That's a good thing. Ask him to help you be realistic about whatever danger there is in the situation. And pray, help me to be wise about a plan of action to deal with whatever real danger there is. Now, being good Lutherans, I can use Martin Luther as an example because his, his uh, experience is well documented in history. So remember, Martin Luther is called on the carpet for proposing reforms to the church. And in the court, he's told, you need to recant of all this awful stuff you've been telling people. And we want your answer tomorrow. Well, if ever there was a reason to have a sleepless night <laughs> for physical danger because he would be declared persona non grata and, and he could be taken captive or killed by anybody if this goes badly for him. And he's thinking, but God, you've been showing me all this stuff. How do I represent you accurately, fairly, with integrity? And finally, God guides him to the simple answer. You've all heard it in, in films along the way. Basically, he says... There's no way that I can recant of everything I've written because some of the things that I've proposed are in the midst of many things that are biblical. And to recant of all of it, it's not all wrong. And I know that it's wrong to go against conscience. And so what I can say to you today is if you can show me from God's word things that are wrong, I can recant of those. But in anything else, 
Here I stand. God help me. I'm trusting God. Take your fear to God. Second part of this, be honest about your anxiety. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of teasing about the whole can't get the robe on, the anxiety thing. It was real, but, but, but it's not of the intensity and importance of what I'll mention next. An area of growth and ministry for me, wherever I've been serving when the church was going through changes, which churches do, my prayer time, which I think I've told you it works best for me to write on a legal pad, on my knees because I stay focused during my prayer time. And, and I've got, Carol will tell you, I've got a box full of those legal pads at home. And, and what I'm doing is pretty much going, what if, Lord, what if, Lord, what if, Lord? And when I'm doing that, it's easy for, for me to get anxious about potential problems that can't be dealt with today. Now, some things we can prepare for. We can deal with them right now. We can, we can do fire drills around here, right? We do fire drills? Yeah, yeah, or tornado instruction or you know, bad weather alerts and, and all those codes. And, yeah, w simple, straightforward. We can deal with what might go wrong by preparing. We can go through the resources that Trinity has. As the, it's going to come one of these days, that big new mortgage payment. And when it does, we have researched all the things that, that we can do. And it's going to work. We just don't know exactly how. Lots of prep time has gone into that. But what I'm talking about are the times over the years when I sense myself becoming anxious over things that haven't happened and might never happen, and they're keeping me from doing what I can do today. And what I've learned about that is that the more honest with God that I can be about what's making me anxious, the more quickly I can hear him saying to me, I'll show you what to do when the time comes. And what's he saying to me? Don't worry about it. Jesus had something to say about that, didn't he? Those birds flying up in the air, <laughs> flowers in the, the field. God takes care of them. Seek first the kingdom of God. All this other stuff will be taken care of. In the clincher, Matthew 6, 34, have you read that recently? So don't worry about tomorrow. <laughs> right? Because tomorrow will have enough worries of its own. Now, now there, there's deep truth behind that. Think about the profoundness of what I'm saying here. You can only live today. You can't live tomorrow, right? Because we're time-bound human beings. We can't jump ahead. Back to the future is a lie, right? <laughs> well, at least for now. But God is not bound by time. He's there tomorrow. I don't know how he does that, but he's already there. He knows that there will be things to worry about tomorrow, but when he's there, you don't have to worry about him. He's here today with us, and he says, I'll take care of what you're working on today. I'll help you get focused on the right things. Give up worrying about tomorrow. So the Apostle Paul finally got that after going through all kinds of crazy things, planting churches. And to the Philippians, he writes this magnificent little verse. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, and I accidentally left out two words. They need to be there. They're, they're in the Bible. With thanksgiving, with a grateful heart peace. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation in your prayers, with thanksgiving, with a grateful heart, let your requests be made known to God. That's what David did, right? Take it to God. I'm not afraid when I take it to you, God. Paul says, you know what happens then? Well, the peace of God that passes understanding will keep your hearts and your minds safe in Christ Jesus. I don't think that he was a doctor, but somehow he got what happens. <laughs> you know, all those stress reactions that mess with our heart rates and, and get our minds spinning? Ask God. We don't need to be anxious about it. Christ will be there so that you can have that peace that passes understanding. So what's the secret to get to that point where asking God happens and it happens with confidence and faith? Point C, know God's love for you. That's a growing process for most of us. And so I, I love some of the Bible stories that help us to see that. One of my favorites is Jesus sleeping in the boat. 
because I love to take naps. And I understand the 10-minute power nap. So, so here, the storm's coming up. And disciples, you know, they, they know how to ne negotiate Lake Galilee. And it's a bad one. And, and so wind and waves and all, Jesus, wake up! Don't you know that we're going to drown? And Jesus says, settle down, wind. Be quiet, waves. Tom and Sue's. Then he says to them, so you still have no faith? <laughs> Come on, that's not fair. You're God. You can do that stuff. Well, do you trust me to be God? Oh. So trust grows, right, when we experience God in, in difficult situations. So the other lake story that, that I love is Peter because Jesus comes walking on the water and Peter says, that's cool, can I try that? <laughs> Jesus says, yeah, come on up, Peter. And it works until Peter starts looking at the size of the waves, takes his eyes off Jesus and sinking, Lord, help me. Jesus rescues him. And it's like that in life, isn't it? Little by little, we learn. Jesus is there. He really does care for me. He has what I need so that through the storms of my life, I can have assurance it's going to be okay. What we ultimately come to understand is this powerful truth. God loves you dearly. You are so precious to him. He knows each one of us as if there was only one of us. He loves every one of us as, as if we were his only child. I don't know how God can do that, but he does. And when it starts to dawn us, he knows what I'm facing today. And he cares. He's here with us today. He knows what you'll be facing tomorrow. Yes, he's already there, and you're not, and he'll be there when you get there. It's okay to take your fears to him. It's okay to take your anxieties to him. He's promised, I am with you always. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He's God. We're not. And there it stands, the cross. God's guarantee to us that it's all true. For Jeremiah, God proclaimed, I have loved you with an everlasting love. In the cross, he makes it even clearer. He's already taken care of our eternal destiny. Certainly he can handle our daily challenges. And so finally, the issue in facing our fears and our anxieties is trusting God's love. And when we do that with confidence, we turn over control of our lives to Jesus Christ. Because then we get the good part. We get to experience Christ's power, like Paul wrote. I have the strength. Well, not really me. I have the strength to face all conditions through the power that Christ gives me. Fear and anxiety, they're going to be part of our life until the day we die. But we don't have to give the devil permission to torture us with our fears and our anxieties we can learn to say with the psalmist, I trust in God, and I'm not afraid. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming from heaven to earth so all of this love of God would be even more powerfully plain and clear to us, and, and we begin to trust and understand your promises about the peace that passes understanding. Help us to take your promises, trust them and apply them, Every time fear and anxiety comes knocking at the door, we pray in your holy name. And let's stand and let's uh, ask God to go to work in our hearts even more than he already is as we sing, Create in me a clean heart, O God.
you're still standing. Sometimes we can't just do church, we have to practice being the church. And I'm going to take time out here because over the next few weeks, we're going to have lots of guests around here. Dedication Day coming up on the 13th, and then Palm Sunday and, and Easter and all of that. And uh, sometimes we're not quite sure how to welcome guests. So this is practice time right now for probably take you 60 seconds to do this. The people who are, are close to you, I'll give you two options. Sometimes I only give you one, but two options. You can look to that person next to you and say, you look great today. Or, don't, don't do that yet, if you look at them and, and, and you're not so sure to say that, just say, you look like you need a hug today. <laughs> so go for it. Practice it right now. <laughs> All that hugging in the name of outreach, right? Because we want to welcome everybody that sets foot in this place in, in the coming weeks. But right now, let's, let's do this next piece of being church, declaring with boldness and confidence why fears and anxieties are not something that control us because of who we believe in. So let's profess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for taking our prayers to the Father's throne of grace, because there's some heavy ones today. Sometimes fear or, or even anxiety about the way this world is going probably happens to us more even at the election season. We're, we're just wondering, how can you, Almighty God, provide leaders that will take this world in the direction you want it to go. And so we're praying that you'll do it, Lord, in your mercy, in our own lives, when those fears or when those anxieties try to get hold of us. We want you to set us free, not just for our sakes, but because the world needs to learn that marvelous secret, how light overcomes darkness. And and so don't stop putting us in tough situations, but keep assuring us that you'll be there with us to make it all the way through. Lord, in your mercy. And the prayers from the congregation today. Heavenly Father, the congregation now lifts before you the following names of friends and loved ones with prayers of praise and supplication. Heavenly Father, we pray at this time for our students, college students, high school students, all who will be traveling in the upcoming spring break season, Lord. We ask for safe travels and be with them. Bless them and return them safely to us, Lord. And Father, we pray for our brother Jerry at this time. We pray for patience, strength, both physical and spiritual, be put upon him, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. Be with him, Lord, we pray. And our sister Karen, Lord, well, you know what's upon her heart, Lord. We ask that you be with her at this time. And Heavenly Gracious Father, we pray for your guidance, wisdom, and blessings for our call committee and the call process as we seek that special senior pastor you have selected for Trinity. May the work they do be a blessing to your church in this place. Lord, in your mercy. And we continue that 
prayer about call processes to ask you, Lord, to send your Holy Spirit to Kevin and Susan Brockberg as Dr. Brockberg considers the call to be the K-8 Executive Director, Principal, Trinity Lutheran School. Give him your guidance, Lord, Lord, in your mercy. And I have one more short list of prayers that came from those who walked the streets of the neighborhood, passing out these invitations to dedication. A prayer for Zachary Miller, who, <laughs> blessed connection, former preschool student of Trinity, moving to Portland, Oregon. Give him safe travels, Lord. For David, an organist for Grace Lutheran Church in St. Cloud. Somebody bumped into him. Bless him in his ministry. One of these heartfelt ones. Josh, going through a divorce and custody battle for a three-and-a-half-year-old and an eight-month-old. Lord, provide wisdom, strength, comfort, and everything else that's needed. And this young dad, Tom, who simply asked that we pray for health for his children. Those and, and all the other prayer requests that we heard yesterday, we lift to your throne of grace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's bring our offerings to the Lord now. You may be seated. Drop these slips into the offering plate now, too. be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who, out of love for his fallen creation, humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. 
But now, risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night when he was arrested and betrayed, took the bread over the Passover meal and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And yes, it's okay to do one more peace of the Lord right now. <laughs> That other one was just practice. This was the real thing. <laughs> this cup which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And this bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Come, for all is now ready.
marvelous proclamation of faith you just made singing that song and receiving this holy meal. May this sacrament strengthen and keep you in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endureth forever. O God the Father, fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. Now we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that we may be enabled constantly to serve you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. magnificent words of blessing that God has for us, so many other people need as well. Would you join me in pronouncing that benediction? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Would you be seated? I'll try to keep it to two minutes. There's just so much going on around here. So this Friday, the the word um, 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 bookathon, whatever that's going on all week, huh? And then finally, it's a reading on Friday night, right? Friday at six o'clock. So that's the start of a, a, a wonderful weekend of stuff on the fifth. Yes, that's why we have the sign-up sheet there, so you don't forget to <laughs> say, I'll come at 8 o'clock in the morning. Okay, you can sleep until 8.30. We'll still have lots of work left to do. Um, that's on Saturday the 5th, but then this, this workshop that I trust may be, well, here's the way I want to view it. The event that creates the attitudes that will allow our next senior pastor to hit the ground running a congregation with attitudes that say we're all about being a blessing to the neighborhood, blessing to our acquaintances, and learning how to be that blessing through connecting with them more effectively in our relationships. So the sign-up sheet's out there, or you can just sign up here. Or you can text me during the week or email because we want to fill this place up. The sign-up sheet has 25 places on it, but God's bigger than that, so let's see what happens. Okay, the following Thursday, March 10th. So this is a big deal, not just because there are 30 or 40 great voices and we're going to have a wonderful choir concert, but because we promised we'd put them up. And they need a place to stay. And we don't want to pay hotels for them. <laughs> so, so if you can let us get in touch with you about what housing you might be able to provide. 30 or 40 people, I saw 15, 20 bedrooms, I think, is what we need. Or Anyway, uh, 
Justin would be thrilled to know that I came up with a bunch of names to hand to him. All right, last thing then on our date list is, so former President Jerry Kieschnick will be our guest preacher for the weekend services on the 12th and 13th, and then our district president, Greg Walton, will kind of oversee the blessing of the building, and uh, as we, we head out of this service outside, get at it pretty quickly so that the other things we want to do to celebrate, taking tours and, and then uh, Josh Wilson and crew doing some music out in the courtyard, and then back in here at 2.15 for people who love organ concerts. Uh, great time playing. By the way, you come in at about, okay, some of you don't come in until 11 o'clock, but some of you start coming in at quarter to 11. Josh Wilson normally walks out about that time from playing at the 9.30 service. Some of you may have done what I did, followed him on Facebook on his two-week trip to China with Nikki, Nico, who sings together with him. And you may have seen the Facebook post where he got down on his knees and said to Nikki, would you marry me? Kneeling on top of the Great Wall of China. Now, how's that for a proposal? <laughs> anyway, when you see them next, give them great big hugs. Yeah, great stuff going on. And uh, that distracted me from what I was supposed to say. They need prayer, okay? <laughs> we, all, we all need prayer. And we are starting an email prayer chain. So if the yellow card on Sunday isn't quite fast enough, during the week, we'll be publishing. In fact, I think it's in, in the Trinity Weekly this week. What, what place you email to, and Marcy Shively is going to check those over and email them on, and you can sign up to be on that prayer list. We're not going to just scattershot them to everybody, but people who want to be involved in prayer during the week, so check that out as well. We're always ready to pray after service, so am I. So that's enough of me talking. Let's stand and, and glorify God one more time by asking to guide us. Let's stand.